The right to know law. Um, I guess the essential understanding that we would like to bring to you is to understand that any time a public body meets as a quorum, acts on matters within its jurisdiction, that's a public meeting. And any public meeting must be preceded by notice to the public of the date, time, and place of the meeting and give permission to the public to attend and tape record and videotape and if you deem it appropriate, depending upon your rules of procedure, allow members of the public to participate. So that's kind of an essential component of every public body. Um, and it also recognizes um, that there are certain activities you do as a meeting at a public body that may not be a meeting. So if a public body is doing collective bargaining discussions or meeting with uh, legal counsel or, or uh, having uh, uh, a circulation of draft documents, that's not a public meeting. So again, um, meetings of a public body, a quorum public body, subject to notice to the public and opportunity for the public to be available to participate. Um, so a lot of times we're asked the question, what is a public body? So it's a legislative body, governing board, commission, or any committee or subcommittee. So certainly I think you would understand that any statutory body, such as the budget committee, which is created by statute, is a public body. But it can also be an advisory committee created by the select board. My wife sat on an advisory committee in my hometown. We were looking at trying to revise our sign ordinance, a, a, a common occurrence these days given some recent rulings from our U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and that is an advisory group to the uh, select board, but it's also a public body. So any uh, legislative body, governing board body, uh, or any committee or subcommittee of a public body is a public body subject to the duty to give notice of its meetings and to let the public participate. And this comes from my hometown, the town of Bow. So when the select board of the town of Bow created a public safety building uh, committee to look into building a new safety pub uh, public safety complex, let me ask if that sounds familiar to you. Um, almost every town and city I know of is dealing with perhaps building a new public safety complex. That subcommittee is also a public body. It has the same duty, uh, which one of which I left out, um, which I should address is not only you have to give notice of your meetings and let the public attend, but you also have to keep minutes of your meetings. Um, so as I've already discussed, <coughs> a meeting is a public body, meeting as a quorum on matters within its jurisdiction, but it also could potentially happen, and this is one of the areas a public body or members there have to be careful about, it could happen where it, the meeting it takes place in person or by telephone or electronic communication. So you have to be cautious when you're holding uh, discussions by email, which as a member of a whole board you probably should avoid, uh, that you have uh, the occasion when you send an email to everyone on a public body, you could have an occasion where you'd slip into a sequential conversation, which is uh, an improper public meeting, a meeting which is the public can't attend, so it would be an improper public meeting. Um, so as I've already indicated, uh, meetings under the right to know law or a quorum of a public body are subject to the right of the public to attend. Just to emphasize, because we get this question a lot, can anyone walk into a public meeting and record? Yes. Do they have to get permission? No. Uh, can they take their recorder and put it on the desk where the select board is meeting? Yes. Can they videotape? Yes. Um, now, there are no obligations for a public body to give people the right to speak, but you might allow people to speak or be required to do so. P budget committees hold public hearings. Clearly, the public is going to speak at a public hearing. But you could have rules of procedure that would say, under certain circumstances, we'll have a public comment period. And if you do have those public comment periods, and if they're in your rules of procedure, one thing to keep in mind, and I always emphasize this, under the right to know law, if you have a meeting procedure rule that says the public has the right to speak at a public comment period, there's a sentence in the right to know law that says, if you have that rule and it's part of your public meeting rules, you've in effect created your own right to know law that applies in Hampton, that is enforceable as if it was part of the right to know law. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would just say that I think it's a good idea to have public comment periods, uh, but uh, if you do have a rule of procedure where the public comment is allowed, I think you should structure it and say uh, it should be addressing an item on the agenda. Uh, and if you want to speak on something other than agenda item, you can do so, but you have to ask beforehand. Uh, and you limit the time period that people can speak. Two, three, five minutes. Five minutes is tops, probably. Uh, and um, 
uh, I would also emphasize when you were talking about the, you know managing public meetings, a public body has the right to manage its meetings so it can get its business done. So people are not allowed to use disruptive speech to thwart your uh, ability to get your job done. Um, as I've already said, email as a meeting is something that can happen. So if you accidentally have a circumstance where one member of the uh, budget committee sends an email to every other member of the budget committee saying, you know, I think that particular uh, purchase that the select board was talking about at the last meeting should have been a subject of an RFP or some kind of public bidding process, you now have uh, a potentially illegal public, non-public session, a public session of a meeting or that's not available for the public to attend, but it's the action, the, the action of the board is happening by email. So what we always encourage you to do, if for some reason you're going to have a discussion that has to be transmitted to the whole board, it's done by staff. The staff sends it out to all the members of the board so that it, it appears as if the Probably email has gone through the, with the, the blind CC section of the, of the email. You don't send it to everyone so everyone can see their email. You just send it so that only the individual thinks they receive it. And so if the person hits reply all, which is the most dangerous button as far as I'm concerned <laughs> in your email systems, uh, they don't, it doesn't get sent out to all the members of the budget committee. So um, it's an area that, to be cautious about and we encourage the spoke and the wheel system. So you have a spoke uh, is the, uh, the town hall, town administrator, the secretary to the board that sends an email out to everybody else and the communication only goes back to her, not to everyone else. And that avoids that you know, illegal sequential communication process. Now, uh, there, is, there are procedures and, and a lot of boards did this before the statute was changed, but there is a procedure now where if you have a member who needs to participate remotely, you can adopt a rule, a, a meeting bylaw, that regulates how someone can do that. So if they're in Florida during the winter and you want to have that person or uh, needs to participate on a matter or is taken away because of the death in the family, but they still want to participate, you could have a procedure rule that allows them to do that. Um, the board should adopt a procedure rule. Uh, you have to be sure that there's a quorum present physically where the meeting's being held. Uh, the member who's going to participate has to be able to be heard by everyone in the room, and everything said in the room has to be heard by the person who's participating remotely. The reason why the person is participating remotely can't just be for the convenience of the member. It has to be because it's impractical for the person to be there. Mm -hmm. So if they were taken, uh, they had to take care of their aging mother out in California for a couple of weeks, that would be a reason of impracticality. Uh, and ultimately, when you do a process like this, um, all votes that are taken with someone participating remotely have to be done by roll call vote. So it's something that could make it easier in certain circumstances when a member can't be present. And finally, of course, uh, just it needs to be emphasized, you have to have public meeting minutes. So when you have a public meeting, you have to have minutes. Now, one of the things that I always try to encourage people to understand is you, you don't have to have, you know, elaborate detailed transcript-like meeting minutes. The, the statute only requires you to list in the minutes of the members present, people participating in the meeting, a summary of the subject that were discussed, and decisions that were reached. Those, that's the minimum requirement of a right to know law public meeting minutes. And they are required to be produced within five business days of your meeting. Um, so you can certainly think about having the, your secretary uh, or other recording person prepare the meeting minutes. Uh, you don't have necessarily a need to approve minutes by a board because, in fact, the idea of approving minutes is not in the right to know law. I think the minutes should be produced by staff, and then at the next meeting that the board is available, if a board member thinks it necessary, they can say, Mr. Chairman, I would wish to amend the meeting minutes, and that amendment could be reflected in the meeting minutes of that meeting. Um, and that's just the best way we think is the way to proceed to comply with the law and get the meeting minutes prepared within the five minutes, five business days you're required. Um, so uh, that's just a quick summary of the right to know law, which I think hits the high points that we think are important to a public body. <laughs>